Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Neighborhood Council Budget Day. Right and early on a Saturday morning. Very happy to see you here in City Hall. Welcome to our Public Works Chambers. Uh, this is where we have our Public Works hearings every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning at 10 a.m. And just a reminder, I think the lights make it obvious, but we are taping, of course, today, videotaping for Channel 35, your city, your channel. So there is a chance, of course, to go back and review um, everything that is uh, that's said today, and thousands of additional people across the city are experiencing what you will experience live here today. Um, I just personally wanted to take a moment to say thank you all for the work that you're doing with the budget advocates. It is some of the, if it's your first time, and I, I met some folks on the way in this morning, it's your first budget day and your first uh, budget season. It is some of the most important work that you will do in the city. It's also some of the most complicated and difficult work that is done in the city of Los Angeles. And a lot of people will say it's, um, it's some of the, uh, the least sexy work that's done in the city, but it really is uh, key to how the city operates. So welcome, thank you, enjoy the day. And um, Howard Ketchen from Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates is next. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Well, good morning and welcome. I'm very glad to see the turnout that we have today. My name is Howard Ketchen. Spelled like kitchen with an A instead of an I. And I serve on the Sherman Oaks Neighborhood Council as a member of the board, executive committee, and as treasurer and finance committee chair. I also serve, that's the punctuation. I, 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 uh, that was the exclamation point. I, I also served as a budget advocate during the recently concluded fiscal year 2013-2014. Change can be difficult, but it is achievable. To change a habit, it takes roughly between 21 to 30 days. Now multiply those numbers by the number of people who work for the city of Los Angeles. This is the challenge Mayor Garcetti assumed and faces in changing a culture, the way things are done in the city of Los Angeles. His Back to Basics agenda is the roadmap by which change will come and will meet the city's challenges and needs. Great streets, infrastructure repair and improvement, investing in revamping the city's technology platform, performance-based budgeting, transparency, accountability, assessment of efficiency, and responsiveness in city operations. These are but some of the keys. Furthermore, the gradual reduction and planned elimination of the gross business receipts tax will help to create a friendlier business environment which will influence business decision makers to start a business or relocate a business to Los Angeles. We, the members of the neighborhood councils, want to play an important and significant role in bringing about change in our communities, which collectively benefits and improves the quality of life for all Angelinos. We ask and need to have the serious attention of the mayor, city council, and departments and agencies uh, and departments and agencies for our role as grassroots representatives of our communities and our role under the city charter to advise, counsel, recommend to all of you. We take our role very seriously, as evidenced by the number of hours we devote as elected, uncompensated volunteers. You needn't worry, we won't be approaching you for a pay increase. So, <laughs> Our time is valuable, and we want to have a dialogue about budgetary matters through the Neighborhood Council budget advocates, who will be elected today, involvement in union negotiations, 
and about issues, ideas, and initiatives which from our vantage point appear feasible, but from your perspective, you may view as a yes, a no, or a maybe so. It needs to be a two-way street in which we learn from you and in turn, and importantly, you learn from us. There are always those who oppose change and think of it as an irritant. To them I say, consider an oyster. Oysters are commonly consumed, perhaps with some lemon juice and a dash of spicy sauce. However, an irritant, such as a few grains of sand, is introduced into an oyster, something begins to happen. Over time, that irritant creates a reaction within the oyster which culminates in the creation of a beautiful pearl. Change and the willingness to adapt to it can and will transition the city of Los Angeles into an efficient, transparent, and connected society in which together we will all create our own beautiful pearl. Now, as an aside, Mayor Garcetti and I happen to share some common experiences. We attended the same summer camp in Malibu. <laughs> we, we both attended and studied as postgraduate students at the internationally renowned London School of Economics in the United Kingdom. And we have an academic interest in international affairs and public policy. But by far, what he, I, and we share is a devotion and commitment to our city of Los Angeles and the communities which comprise it. Please join me in welcoming to the podium to address us this morning the mayor of the city of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti. Okay, I'm so sorry to say, Gimli Hill Park Camp. Yeah, right. Al Gimli was my uncle. Wow, wow. Yeah. Well, thank you, Howard, my now long lost cousin that I didn't realize I had. Um, thank you so much, and thank you to all the budget advocates. And look at this room. I mean, look around. It's, we're at capacity, standing room only. Um, thank you to Kevin James for inviting us to your house here and to opening up what is one of the most beautiful rooms with the worst acoustics in the city. Um, but we'll work on that. And, um, and because this is being recorded, I, I promise not to talk as if I'm at a King celebration. Um, but instead, <laughs> we will focus on sober and reflective words. Um, I also want to thank all of you for what you do for this city. I love coming to this. I, I love coming to this event every single year. And I love that you're starting so early. You're only a month and a half behind where we start working on next year's budget, which is to say on July 1st, when the new budget is in place, that's when we start planning. In some ways, we start planning even before the budget is done. And I want to thank Miguel Santana, who has led the city through the rockiest economic waters we have faced in our lifetimes, um, and has done it with a great team at the CAO's office, our city council, led by Paul Kerkorian on the uh, budget committee, and Bernard Parks before that, who have both been very strong budget uh, chairmen. Um, and all of the staff of our city departments that really do dig into this work. Um, and I love the metaphors that, are, that you used in terms of, of how we're going to create something beautiful out of what might seem to be difficult at first. Let me check in with you um, before I talk about the budget more broadly about the city and give you an idea of uh, whether you're getting your money's worth from City Hall these days and, and how your mayor is seeking to lead the city. When I came into office as mayor, a lot of people asked me, you've been around for a while now. I'm the longest serving elected official in City Hall, which should scare you as much as it scares me to say. But it is um, something that gives me the perspectives of not really being surprised by a lot of the issues because I've worked on them for 12 years. But one thing I was surprised, becoming an executive, and under the charter, the mayor is the chief executive of the city. And I really took that seriously. I read the charter and I do things in it, like reviewing our general managers each year, which the voters voted in but had never been done for 15 years since we had the charter, a basic management tool. 
Um, and the, the biggest surprise for me was the depth in which that culture had set in that killed innovation, that told our amazing workers, don't ever try to fail forward. The only way you'll promote is by keeping your head down. And let's just keep those systems going that are 20, 30, 50, sometimes 70 years old. For instance, uh, we uh, learned recently that some of the discipline system at LAPD, as Chief Beck's renewal was up, that was written by a sergeant who went by the name of Parker, who later became the chief in the 1930s. Don't you think we should probably update our discipline system? A few things have changed with the city and with the police department since the 1930s. Um, when we look at our diversity playbook, it's from the 70s. It was a necessary step there, but it doesn't do enough for what we need to really broadly think about the issue of diversity. Our technology playbook is at least 30 years old. Um, we program in languages that nobody really, you know, everybody else is buried in the ground like Fortran and Pascal and all these things that don't exist anymore. I've gone with Rick Cole because I like to show up as a chief executive and surprise my general managers and say, hey, give me a tour of your department. And I've gone down into the basement of City Hall East to look at our servers that take all of our computer systems and actually watch the battery acid dripping out of them, wondering why is it that we insist on maintaining these when everybody else is going to the cloud to save money and to be more efficient with the services. These things have given me maybe double the resolve even as when I came in to empower our people inside and outside of City Hall to be the change agents, to make sure that these budget discussions aren't the narrow ones that we used to have, where we'd all get together and say, okay, what are we gonna cut? I used to go over to the LA Times editorial board as city council president, as a mayoral candidate, even as mayor, they say, okay, you have a deficit, what are you gonna cut, which programs? Which was always a false approach. Nobody said, how are you gonna increase efficiencies? How are you gonna squeeze more out with the existing resources or less? In other words, they gave us a pass on management and just gave us a menu as if we were suddenly going to cut out the libraries or not answer 911 calls or forget some of the core things we do. I've tried to change that conversation so that people from every corner of this city will be surprised if I show up and visit. I call city employees every week who are kind of the heroes of innovation and they can't believe they have the mayor on the phone, but I say it is me and I want to thank you whether it's a firefighter who was in great danger and got burned, or whether it was a, a technician who figured out a better way to do things. We've got people in uh, Rick Cole's um, staff that are from a performance management unit, almost an in-house you know, management consultant group that is going in with people like Bob Stone, who's working for a dollar a year, the guy who kind of invented the term reinventing government and worked in Washington to do that stuff, is here. And he'll go into a sanitation yard where people have had all of the innovation beaten out of them for 20 years, even though they have great ideas and those sanitation workers know better than anybody the changes that need to be made. And by the time he leaves, they're all rallying and saying, we can be these change agents. People like the individual that I highlighted from Reckon Parks in my first State of the City address, and it was important for me not only to tell the story, but to have him there, because when he figured out that our um, uh, air conditioning systems and all of our rec centers we're on all the time, which costs us all money, is bad for the environment, uh, and asked permission to change it, and the bureaucracy said no. He just went out and got a button and a timer, and he installed one, and everybody saw that it worked, and then we installed it everywhere, and it's going to save us half a million dollars from the first time he did that. Talking to the head of ITA, Steve Reniker, and saying, let's start moving that stuff to the cloud, and we're going to start saving millions of dollars each year because many of the services that we all put, like our email, is not on our computers anymore, it's out there in the Google servers or Yahoo has it or whoever, we can do those things inside government and save money. So the big check-in I want to do before I get to the budget is how's the city doing? By many measures, we're doing quite well. Um, we're on the rise. We have a record number of visitors here, a record number of residents, a record number of students that are here, all measures that people still want to be in this city. I, I have a lot of sympathy for my fellow Mayor, Mayor Dugan, Dugan and, uh, in Detroit, he has a different sort of problem. He's trying to bring people there. He has different metrics, which are much more basic. Here, people still want to come to Los Angeles. And it's being reflected in our economy, which since I became mayor, has added more than 40,000 jobs to the economy, more than 20,000 new businesses, the most rapid uh, job growth that we've seen in a couple decades. But we have to make sure that it hits all neighborhoods and all people doesn't leave anybody behind, which is why I'm focused with my business team on recruiting companies to come here. Uh, investment from abroad, when we see just even in this neighborhood downtown, three projects that total more than $3 billion that are funded from capital that is overseas. The tallest building west of the Mississippi where the Wilshire Grand once was, creating about 10,000 jobs um, from Korean uh, capital. Two Chinese projects a little bit south to that. 
going to Mexico and pushing the exports of companies here that only really import, uh, sorry, export about 1% of the companies have any exports abroad, and we can boost that to boost our own economy, given that we have the largest port in this country, we have the most important airport in this country, and we have the most creativity and the highest level of entrepreneurs in the nation. And I start with that because also with our budgeting, we always just look at the, the kind of cost side, which I'll get to in a second. But it's really two things. It's our revenues and our costs. And that's why I'm so focused on boosting our revenues, making this more business friendly. When the Metropolis Project, which is one of the three that I just mentioned, north of Staples Center, came to us, we were able to give them their permits four months after they came to us on a huge project which normally would have been on average a year and a half to two years, which means the economy is now moving, those jobs are starting. We figured out systems that work better for people, whether it's the homeowner who used to have to take a day off of work just to get your bathroom checked off or your kitchen when you're doing renovations. We now have Saturday visits that you can schedule a day or two before and we'll come to you on the weekend. Or whether it's the big projects like that, absolutely, that's the kind of innovation I wanna see. Or whether it's the big projects like that where we know that they know they have to stay into a certain size, but they don't even have the plans done and they're excavating because we want them to get in the dirt and work with them simultaneously instead of work with planning for a long time, they'll give you your approval. Work with the first part of building safety for a long time, then they'll give you approval. And then finally, maybe you can start building after that. That doesn't work for those people that are actually on the move in this city. We see also important signs throughout this city, whether it's public safety at its lowest, uh, its highest, sorry, its highest level crime to its lowest level since 1949, a much more metric-driven city in which I'm asking people to measure things and share them, so that when we learn that a 311 wait time is an unacceptably high level, this year we reduce that by 83% by going in there and making sure that we change the systems, get the people in place, have the leadership and the accountability. I told my general managers, I'm not going to micromanage you, but you're going to be more accountable. In other words, I'm not gonna ignore you, and then when you screw something up, I'll micromanage you and then go away once that's fixed. I'm gonna be there regularly. I'm gonna check in with you, you're gonna be part of a cabinet, and we're gonna to lead together the change that we wanna see in this city. And it's beginning to bear fruit. So let me turn specifically now to the budget. For me, city services, more jobs, and infrastructure are the three keys to my time as your mayor. That's what I wanna leave behind. An economy that's on fire, city services that are restored, and infrastructure that we're building so that when I hand the baton to the next guy or gal, he or she is going to be able to say we're well on our way to fixing those pipes, improving our airport and our port, our streets, and our transportation system. I appreciate the white paper that you put out very much because it gets the key of infrastructure. And I want to start from an inspirational place rather than what we read about, which is, oh my God, it's so expensive and we can overestimate and say, you know, it's billions upon tens of billions of dollars to do infrastructure in this city and there's no way we'll ever get it done. About 15 years ago, our sewers were so old that when it rained, they would burst. And for those of you, there's three pipes in the city of LA. Some cities do it differently, but we have our water supply pipes, we have our storm drains, and we have our sewer supply. And our sewer pipes would burst, go up onto the streets and go into our storm drains, which go directly untreated to the LA River, to our lakes, and eventually to the ocean, which is why it used to be on a rainy day, you didn't want to go to the ocean. You would think rain would clean a city, it did the opposite. It made it the dirtiest it could be. And we looked at the price tag and, and we looked at the lawsuits that environmental groups and community groups from you know, Baldwin Hills to Heal the Bay and others were saying because they didn't want open sewage, understandably, on their streets. We said, it's just too expensive, and we fought those lawsuits. When I came into city council, I sat down with a group of environmentalists. I sat down with our Bureau of Sanitation and I said, and our CLA at the time, Ron Deaton. I said, why do we keep fighting that? And Ron Deaton said, because we can't afford it. I said, I think we can probably do something different. And what if we went to the people and actually asked them about that? And we managed a way to be able to redo our almost entire sewer system, which is still at the last parts of it, and our storm drain system by going to the voters with Proposition O, the largest local clean water bond in the nation's history, which passed with the second highest vote of anything we've ever put on the ballot. In other words, people will pay for what they know will bring improvements. They won't pay for it if they don't trust who's spending it, and they won't pay for it if it's too general or it feels like a bunch of pork. We know, like a house, we have to maintain our city, and that if we defer those things, we will pay sooner or later. A burst pipe on Sunset Boulevard, we pay for, even if we didn't have a rate increase. Sooner or later, we pay for these things. So in that, we paid about $15 billion over the last uh, um, 20 years and took 95% of the trash out of the Los Angeles River. Now you look at the storm drains, and they have little catch uh, 
uh, inserts that keep the trash from going in there before and we clean it up and take it away. We rebuilt those pipes so that now our sewers are quite secure. Um, and I use this as an example because whether we look at the DWP, whether we look at paving our streets or our sidewalks, we can do this. It won't happen in two years when people say, well, it's gone on for 70 years, Mayor, I haven't seen it fixed yet while you've been there. Well, we have to actually be smart about how we do it. I won't take a uh, half cent sales tax of the voters if they're not trusting yet that our Bureau of Street Services can do the work. And we have to work with them to make sure they can do better and better, and we are, which is why this year we're gonna pave more streets than we ever have with the same budget because we feel working together, we can do marvelous things. Case in point, when that pipe broke on Sunset Boulevard, when we came and looked at that afterwards, and we were told initially it would be about two weeks till Sunset Boulevard was going to be opened, we sat down and did kind of an after action report. We had the fire department, we had DWP, we had public works there, general services, um, transportation. And Don Liu, my deputy mayor who oversees city services, got out there the first day and he's not an expert on how to fill a street, pave it, how to fix a pipe, but when they told him two weeks, he said, no, we're gonna figure out a way to do it more quickly. And once the city family had the permission to innovate, to think about how to do it differently, they engineered it on the spot, found the welders who are the best in the country to figure out three pipes at three different levels, how they could redesign the joint that was so flawed from 50 plus years ago, how the city could figure out a new way to fill that hole in a week and a half more quickly and pave it. And it was like a ballet. They came together with the very best workers that you would be proud of. So while we want transparency at DWP, that is not to say that we don't have extraordinary people at DWP. While we want to do better with street services, that isn't to say those folks went out there and got it open for the Monday commute. Because when you empower people to do that and you have a budget that is in line with those values, we are an unstoppable force in this city. We have the intellectual know-how, we have the work experience, and now what we're trying to bring is the spirit of innovation to the budget. So as you look at this year and as you look at infrastructure, there's three or four areas. One, you'll see us announce, and we'd love to work with many of you in the next probably month or so, a plan for our sidewalks. That again, isn't gonna be a one-year plan or a two-year plan, but a very aggressive plan considering where we've been. To fix the broken sidewalks in this city. And then to figure out, once we fix them, maybe then we go back to a system where people have the responsibility of the property owners, but not somebody who has inherited a bad sidewalk who would lose their home if they had to fix it or a property owner, but go to something which we do our part and fix those starting in front of our city facilities where we have extra liability and looking at a way that we can spend those millions of dollars. Already this year I put in the budget partially because we didn't spend last year's, but we doubled and then added another seven million. We have $27 million where we only had 10 million uh, last year and almost nothing the year before. That is a commitment to infrastructure that will fix those sidewalks long term. Next, our streets. I want to get things right before we go to the voters, but in 2016, I've said if we do a transportation initiative again for this county, and I'm chairing the MTA right now, I will only support it if we can take the local return dollars which come to each city and make sure that goes to our streets because that is a way to long-term finance that and to make sure that our streets aren't broken and that we tie in our environmental needs, our great streets program, and all the things that we wind up doing one thing and then we realize there's a second initiative and we have to change the street all over again or dig it up because we didn't coordinate with the gas company or the cable company or DWP. So get, get smart and put those things in line before we move out, but for me, that is probably the best way forward on the streets. And at DWP, I led the way a few years ago to say we have to boost what we're spending on infrastructure. Already it's about 40% more on our pipes. I'll give you an example. There's pipes, there's valves, and there's joints. The valves, which are so important, since we've started this, had about a 4% failure rate, which may seem low, but the number of valves we have and the number of streets that could burst because of those bad valves, uh, that was pretty bad. And just in the last three years, we've seen that go down to less than half a percent because we found the bad ones, we fixed them. I can't guarantee you another one won't burst. In fact, I will guarantee you another one will. But in the meantime, we're gonna bring down the possibility that the valves and next to the joints and then the pipes will, will do that and we can figure out a way to do that together. And I hope that I've built the credibility with you and with the city to make those sorts of asks at the right time. Because I haven't started by coming with my hand open and saying we're gonna keep all the systems the same. We're gonna pay people whatever they want. We're not gonna hold the line on things like pensions and, and pay. And we have a tremendous city employees who get it and progressive unions who are figuring it out. For all the fights with our DWP union, they were the ones who came to us at the beginning of last year. It wasn't quite as tough as I wanted, so I held out for an even better uh, um, deal. 
but they created a new pension tier because they know their pensions were unsustainable. We figured out a way to take a, a due raise and to push that off four years and have three years without raises because it was the right thing for the city. Our police officers stepped up and at huge sacrifices to themselves took 20% pay cuts as new police officers, which we're now writing as we come out of the, the recession to make sure that we had our fiscal strength. So our employees understand how important this is, but I will hold that line with anybody who disagrees with me because then that allows me to come to you and say, this is now where we can spend that money to make sure our home is strong here in LA. So one last note I wanna say is the, the participation that you have shown me in this last year, and so many of you, probably all of you, came for the first time to our budget hearings. Uh, as I said a year ago, I'm not just gonna come to you when my budget's drafted and say, hey, pick three categories and vote on it. Do you like public safety more than public works? Okay, great, thanks for your opinion, bye-bye. I'm going to do something that's legitimately engaging with the community. And we held those budget hearings. We had more than 1,400 people come out. Again, not for the compensation and not for the free food, as nice it was, was to have some a couple places, but to actually engage with their ideas and thoughts on the budget. And they gave us ideas, like that code enforcement was taking too long to roll out in certain communities where we had properties that were you know, uh, vacant or that were, the owners were derelict. And so we put into this year's budget, without taking it from the general fund, enough code enforcement inspectors to make sure that's going to be a 24-hour, 48-hour process, because you said it. We listened to people who said some very specific, innovative ideas of what to do, whether it was on our pensions, whether it was on the way that we do business, whether it was our IT. These are the places that we actually balance the budget, not by saying, I like this program more than that, because you might like the, love the libraries, but somebody else needs the housing department. And I don't want to pick and choose between someone's needs in this city. If we have programs that are good, let's keep them. And let's do the disciplined work of figuring out a better way to pay for them. This year, we plan to continue to ramp that up, to have those discussions early, to listen in, and to take performance-based budgeting, which Rick Cole has pioneered, working together with Miguel Santana, which will take two or three years to get the culture in there. And a lot of people said, well, the budget looks pretty much similar to the year before. There are elements that did, but the beginning of saying, I don't want to just look at line items, I want to judge outcomes of my department, is where we're moving to. So that people can say, with my budget, I achieved this, not I received this. And for me, that is going to be the revolution on how we budget and how we look at things. And as advocates, my very last note is advocate for the supply side too. If you sit here and we have to go through that terrible exercise of what we're going to cut, or what we're gonna to try to extract from our own employees or all those things which are hard work and can be done, but ultimately because none of us did the work to build the revenue side, then it's gonna be a sad conversation for a long time. It's gonna be a very slow recovery. But if we come back here a year or two and those leads you have of new businesses or those, uh, those encouragements you have along the great streets to see vacant storefronts open, we're gonna have a city that is on the move. The Guardian uh, newspaper, British paper, this year did a survey of the 50 greatest cities in the world. And they looked at their brand strength through a scientific kind of uh, measure that they put together based on weather, economy, crime, social media buzz, et cetera. And they were surprised with what city came out, number one, as I think many of us were. It was Los Angeles, just above New York, just above London. In the world, in the world. So the strength that we have to market this city, you'll see me sometimes away from the city. And unfortunately, whenever I leave, something bad seems to happen, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> but whether it's going to Mexico to make sure that there's jobs that are coming back here, whether it's going to Asia to make sure that investment doesn't go to a Chicago, New York, or San Francisco above us, I will be aggressive in this global economy in making sure that people know not only do they want to do business in Los Angeles, they have to do business here in Los Angeles. In tech, in the entertainment industry, which you saw maybe this week, we, I went up to Sacramento with the other Big Ten city mayors in California, and we're on the verge of a huge expansion of our uh, film jobs bill that's up there. Uh, whether it was somebody from the industry. <laughs> whether it's manufacturing, which with four counties, I brought together uh, Orange, Ventura, San Diego, and LA to get a designation from the Obama administration for our aerospace uh, and defense manufacturing capacity and build that back up and we have now $1.3 billion available to us to retool our manufacturing and to train next generation of workers. Whether it's banking and healthcare, which are huge industries that are based here that we never talk about, 
or whether it's new industries like digital technology and clean technology, Los Angeles is going to be the place that on the supply side will move forward. So thank you all for what you do. I couldn't be prouder to be your mayor. Let's make sure that uh, year two for me, there's no such thing as a sophomore slump. I told myself it's going to be a sophomore sore. And we're going to have a great year together and even stronger because of the work that you do as budget advocates. Thank you so much. Good morning, good morning. My name is Marcello Robinson from Westwood Neighborhood Council. I'm a budget rep. Uh, this is my fourth year as a budget advocate and my last day as a budget advocate. To the budget representatives, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to serve. This morning I have the honor of introducing uh, one of the hardest working uh, general managers, our leader, uh, who has definitely seen her, seen her fair share of budget cuts. Uh, please help me welcome uh, general manager of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, Ms. Gracie Liu. Thank you, Marcella. Hi, good morning, Neighborhood Council leaders. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, I'm just gonna be really quick and do a bunch of thank yous uh, because this day um, is not possible without a lot of our, our partners and collaboration across the city. So firstly, um, I know he's, he's gone on to his busy day. You know, uh, Mayor Garcetti and his excellent team with Deputy Mayor of Budget and Innovation, um, Rick Cole, they've been amazing this year and um, and I so appreciate their spirit of collaboration and really wanting to work with neighborhood councils. Uh, that's been important and um, very exciting. And I, and I, th and I think we have um, some, some really great times ahead of us um, in terms of uh, the next year. So uh, Controller Ron Galperin, uh, he's you know one of us. I, I'm always gonna claim him as you know, being a neighborhood council person and actually was a budget rep and advocate. Uh, so he knows what it's like to do the work that you're, you're doing. Um, council member Paul Krikorian, who's my, my council member because uh, I live in his district, but uh, he's great and always has been a huge supporter of neighborhood council. So uh, I wanna appreciate him and his work on the budget and finance committee. And CAO uh, Miguel Santana, of course, uh, who again, as Mayor Garcetti said, has led us through a really, really tough um, budget years of the past, you know, at least four or five years. Um, neighborhood council budget advocates, they've been, Again, so hardworking, all these volunteer hours, and um, I, I just I appreciate them so much. You don't you don't understand like these hours that they put in. It's it's really incredible. And of course, you know our budget uh, representatives today. Um, I want to thank you so much. Uh, I know that you think maybe you know you're going to come here today and. Um, select your budget advocates and your work will be done. It is not. This is the first day we're going to be. You know on this journey together for the next year, so uh, get, get prepared. And, and I want this to make sure to be a dialogue that if you don't hear anything from budget advocates or from us or from the city during the year that you come and you say, hey, what's, what's going on? Um, so take this back to your neighbor councils. This is a dialogue for the entire year and, and we need to just stay engaged for that time period. Um, I also want to just thank our staff, our hardworking staff. Uh, they they put in a lot of hours for you guys, and and they're, we're small, but we're, we're ornery, and we we get our job done. <laughs> so um, so we appreciate um, your patience with us while we try new things and try to innovate ourselves and to make your jobs easier. In um, particular, Joseph Hari, who was my policy director, who really yes, please give him a hand. <laughs> he really really takes you on this journey for the whole year, too, in terms of um, working with the budget advocates. Uh, so our other really hardworking partners are the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners. And um, I do want to introduce them. And if you could stand um, and be acknowledged for your wonderful work, uh, uh, our president, uh, Karen Mack. Yes, there she is. Yay. Uh, for the central area, um, Len Schaefer. Uh, from the South Valley area. He's in the back over there. Um, Lydia Grant from the North Valley, who's been awesome attending many of your meetings. Um, Eli Littman from the West area. Yay, and I see Lucy back there, his cute daughter. Um, Joy Atkinson from South. Yay. 
<laughs> Thanks, Joy. One of our newer uh, commissioners has been great. Victor Medina from the Harbor area. Thank you so much. And um, Olivia Rubio from the East area, and I'm not sure she was able to come today, but um, again, they're your commission, and um, they've been working extremely hard for you as well. Um, so I want to just again thank you, and is recently uh, we had a, a GM review with uh, Mayor Garcetti, and afterwards I sent, and sent him a card that said thank you for your awesomeness, because he's really great. And again, I want to thank you guys for your awesomeness as well, because I so appreciate the work that you do. Have a great day today. Good morning, everybody. So my name is, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jay Handel. I co-chair the Budget Advocates. I'm in my third year of co-chairing this organization, and I couldn't be prouder of this work that's done by this group. So first of all, I'd like to thank all of the budget advocates who worked this year, could you please stand and just wave and let people know who you are. For those of you who don't know, and, and what Gracie was saying is so true, this is not hundreds of hours, this is thousands of hours of work that's done on the budget. We started, when I came in three years ago, we started looking at the budget in a very narrow way. And at this point, we have dug into every area of the budget that we can find. Our committees have broken down and worked with union leaders, department heads, staffs. Anybody that would talk to us for the first year and a half became the people who encouraged everyone who wouldn't talk to us to come to us in the next year and a half. That's how important the work is that we've done. So I have to thank the budget advocates who all have given so much time and so much energy. Before I go into the slides, I'd like to thank, just as Gracie was saying, the staff. Dunn staff, we couldn't have done what we did without Dunn staff helping us. Joe, Stephen, Savak, Jose, Everybody who volunteered here today, you know, it's tough. This staff was 60 some odd people in 2008 and it's 20 some odd people now working with 95 neighborhood councils. So when we feel the frustrations out there, take a step back, take a breath and remember what's happened during the economic crisis and what's happened to this department. Probably one of the most cut departments in the entire city. So. And, and again, staff, staff, without staff, we could have never done what we did. So today we embark on a new journey. And I'm going to ask that we start to uh, run the slides. I'm not going to read the slides. I'd like you to read them as I speak because this is how the system works. This is what the budget is all about and how we work as budget advocates. So today what's going to happen is you're going to leave here today and you're gonna go up to a room, and the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna elect your budget advocates, which is three people from each region. You are gonna trust those people to dig in to the issues in your community and bring them back to the city so that we can prioritize and help the mayor and his budget team prioritize exactly what we need to have happen to make our city a better city. And, and on that note, I also have to say, the budget team from the mayor's office has been terrific, and we have a new cooperation with them going forward this year, and I see this partnership as being vital to our city, because I truly believe that without the citizen's voice being heard by the right people in the city hall, it's not gonna make a difference, and I think we have the right people this year, so we look forward to that. So today you will go up and you will, you will elect your three budget advocates. The budget advocates will get together and they will elect your new executive team that works for you and really organizes and digs in to the budget to get you the information, get the information from you and to you. And I say and to you, it's really, really important. If you're gonna be a budget advocate this year, it's going to be incumbent on you to report back 
to all of the neighborhood councils in your district monthly to let them know what's going on in the work you're doing and the results that we're finding and the information that we get in working with the mayor's budget team. And this, quite frankly, has been an issue over the past few years where budget advocates, they get involved and then they see it's a lot of work and then they go, well, I don't know, and people stop showing up. So this year, if you're going to run to be a budget advocate, you must be prepared to put in a lot of hours. And that's not to scare you, but it is. Because the truth of the matter is, when you do not do that work, you let down all the stakeholders in your area on the issues of budget. Is budget sexy? I always say, no. Ron Galpin emailed me and said, no, but money is. And we should, we should take that into account, that money is very important and sexy. But the budget is everything we live on in this city. And that's really the bottom line. So when people say, oh, it's the budget, it's dry, it's numbers. No, it's not. It's potholes. It's sidewalks. It's police and fire. It's public works. It's everything this city runs on is money. So if we don't care about it because we don't think it's important or we don't think it's sexy, then we're letting ourselves down. So today, you all have an opportunity. And the opportunity is to stand up for your community. Because this is a very large city and a very diverse city. If I go to the west side, it's traffic. If I go to the east side, it may be street vendors. If I go to the south, it's other issues. If I go to the port, it's other issues. We need to bring all those issues back. And while we know and we've heard our mayor say and we've heard the budget team say there's only so much money and so many things we can do, but if we're innovative because we bring those ideas to the city, there may be things we can bring to them that might not cost money, that might generate revenue. Because as much as we've heard for four years, cut, 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 lack of service, lack of service, lack of service, reality is we need to start generating revenue for this city and bringing this city to be what we were voted number one. Let's make it number one for everybody's eyes in our city. So today is an important day for everyone who steps up to the plate. Whether or not you can fulfill what used to be a one-month situation, it's not a one-month situation. It's a 12-month situation. You've heard the mayor say we're starting earlier. Our goal next year is to have this budget day in June so that we can hit the road running July 1. That's what our bylaws say. You've all had packets. You all have the bylaws. We all run by the rules. So the goal this year now that we've changed the bylaws to begin July 1, is to have our budget day in June and hit the road running with the city. So the biggest question, the biggest issue is right there in bullet point three. We're going to create greater involvement. And that's all of you. And that's the four million people out in the city. You have to reach out and touch them. The budget 101 sessions were good. They had about 1,500 people. A couple of years ago when we had a budget survey, we had 10,000 people, okay? The goal this year, I believe in our cooperative effort is to have another survey and to reach as many people as humanly possible and to focus on the big issues to bring this city back. So I look forward to working with everybody here. I'll look forward to everyone who's willing to volunteer. And for those budget reps, you've already volunteered, so I thank you. I thank you for getting involved from step one. So for those of you who are going to run for budget advocate, I again stress, it's a long process, but it's a very rewarding process in the end because we're seeing the change in our city. We're seeing the economic upswing in our city. And the more we can do to make it better, the better staff throughout the city is going to be able to work, which in turn comes back to us you know, in benefit. So I thank you all for being here. I thank you all for getting up very early and giving up your Saturday. And um, good luck to all of you who are running for budget advocate. And I look forward to working with you all. Thank you.
So at this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce the deputy mayor who, with his staff, will be working with us, and we will be working with him, and he's got it all on his shoulders. This is all his stuff, it's all a budget. So Deputy Mayor Rick Hall. Well, good morning. Um, given that uh, my boss has taken some time to talk with you about how we work in government in the Garcetti administration, and I'm gonna have my colleague, the CIO, Miguel Santana, talk to you more about the numbers involved in next year's budget, and we're gonna hear from uh, our dear friends, the chair of the budget committee, uh, Paul Krikorian, and our controller, Ron Galprin. I'm gonna make my comments very short. And I'd just like to ask you to remember three things about what I share with you today. And so let me tell you what those three things are, and I'm gonna tell them to you, and then I'm gonna repeat them at the end, just like they do in the Army, because I really want you to go away and to remember them. The first is performance budgeting. The second is collaboration. And the third, not surprisingly on a day like today, is empowerment. So let's start with performance budgeting. Performance budgeting, as the mayor began to outline, is to change the conversation. In fact, that's what we call this year's budget. Change the conversation from short-term fixes to long-term sustainability. Now, Jay is fond of saying that the budget is not sexy. And I don't take that personally. <laughs> but I will say this. The reality is that none of you would be here today if everything was great about the budget. Right? There are better things to do in Los Angeles uh, than spend an entire beautiful day talking about the budget. But we have some real challenges. And if, if you continue to apply the same solutions to an enduring problem, you don't get change. If you want to have change, you have to change not just the conversation, but the way in which you tackle budgeting. And that's what performance budgeting is. It's a partnership between the mayor, the council, the departments, and the community to focus not on what we spend, but how we spend it. Focus not on what we allocate, but what we achieve. And last year, when I stood before you, we talked about it being a marathon and not a sprint. Well, we're in the first leg of that marathon, and we made some real progress. But as the mayor said a few moments ago, this year's budget looks a lot like last year's budget, because moving a $5.3 billion operation does take some time. But that is it's critical because of changing the conversation that we change our vocabulary, that we begin to catch ourselves when we say, well, what are we gonna cut? We begin to focus on, well, what are we gonna spend our money on? What, are, what results are we gonna achieve? And you have the opportunity to begin that process um, with the survey. How many of you have already filled out the, the little survey today? Okay, all of you have it in your packets, that's great. More than half of you have already filled it out. Uh, it's just the beginning step of asking for your participation in this process to get some direct feedback from you. So let's focus on performance. Let's focus on what we're trying to achieve. Let me just give you one single example of what that means. As the mayor said, we are not spending any more on street repair this year. Uh, Matt, what's the number, 165 million? 140 million uh, we're spending on street repair. That's the same amount we spent last year. How many miles did we pave last year with $140 million? Well, people are saying, well, not on my street. <laughs> That's what I care about. Um, what, we, what we paved last year was 2,200 lane miles. So that means, you know, that's one mile of a, of a six-lane street is six lane miles. Uh, one mile of a two-lane street is two lane miles. So you put all that together. We repaved, that doesn't count the 350,000 potholes we, we filled, that means repaving 2,200 miles. As the mayor said, we got all of the departments that work on street paving, and it's not just the Bureau of Street 
um, standards. It's, uh, it's also the Bureau of Engineering. It's also Department of Transportation. It's also Contract Administration. We got all those departments together, and we put together a plan to get 2,400 miles, a 10% increase. As the mayor said, that'll be the biggest and most we've ever paved in the history of the city. So that's what performance is about. It's, it's not about how many dollars we spent. It's how many miles we paved. So let's focus on results. So that's, that's what performance is about. It's changing the conversation from just abstract numbers to the actual things you can see and feel and measure. The second theme I want to talk about is collaboration. Now we all know how to do the other way, right? It's the valley against the central city. It's the mayor against the council. It's the affluent neighborhoods against the lower income neighborhoods. It's public safety against all the other services. It's me against you. That's what the newspapers like to write about, right? That's what the TV, the cameras don't come out to hear another great day in Los Angeles. <laughs> Sports and weather next. <laughs> they love lets you and them fight. We struck a different tone in this administration because that's the kind of mayor we have. He believed you get more done when you bring people together and you find common ground. And so there was a lot of skepticism last year because there's been such a history in this tough economic challenges we've been in. There's been so much name calling. There's been so many cats thrown at each other. There's been so much bad blood that the idea that we could collaborate together seemed really the most idealistic thing of all. And yet we did. We brought forward the mayor's budget, not as a mysterious black box that the council had no idea what was coming, but we worked with the, with the council staff members and the, and the council members themselves. And we, we asked about, the mayor sat down with all 15 of the city council members individually and talked to them about budget priorities. That takes time, but it was worth the time. We went through those long budget hearings and 350 budget reports and all that testimony. But the spirit of collaboration meant, here's, here's a number, $5.3 billion budget. Do you know how much the council changed during their deliberation? 0.1% they changed and they added 0.2% of priorities with some additional funding that came in at the end because the budget cycle continues. That's not because the mayor was smarter than the council. That's because the mayor worked with the council and brought to them a budget that made sense for the city. That's what collaboration is about and that's the spirit we're trying to strike in this city is bring, instead of bringing, instead of pitting public safety against other services, Let's bring public safety and other services together because we can't have good libraries or good parks without safe streets. And we can't have safe streets unless we're educating kids and giving them alternatives for things to do besides get in trouble. They're together. They shouldn't be pitted apart. We should be focused on results, not on battling. And we should work together to find common ground. Now that doesn't mean we won't have disagreements. In a city of four million people, disagreement is okay. What's not helpful is fighting and name calling. When we disagree, we, we need to together find the answers. So let me now focus on empowerment. That's probably the most difficult challenge of all. And, and I've had really candid conversations individually and sitting down with the budget advocates and the neighborhood council representatives uh, and I've, I've listened to, to the frustrations of feeling not really heard and a feeling that, that there isn't a way to impact this huge $5.3 billion behemoth and a sense of frustration that for all the hours that have been put into working hard to understand the budget 
and to come up with sensible recommendations that there isn't more significant change that's visible. Um, there are sayings that sort of capture the wisdom of the ages. And, and in the Mexican culture, they call them dichos or proverbs. And one of my favorite is, poco a poco se va lejos. In English, what that means very simply is, little by little, you go a long way. That's how you get on a journey of a thousand miles. It begins with the first step. And so if we think about this spirit of collaboration, this is the first step. This is August. The budget will be adopted in May. And this first step we have actually already been preparing for. We've already sat down with the neighborhood budget advocates from, from this year to plan for the upcoming year. And that's what the survey in your packet is a, is a result of, is where there was a suggestion to have a survey. We did it. We worked with um, Michelle Bologna and Jay Handel and others worked on that survey that's now in your packet. That's a joint product of our working together. But poco a poco means that this year we actually made some progress. The mayor talked about code enforcement, which came out of the budget town halls. We more than doubled the hours of code enforcement uh, in the city as a result of this. We more than doubled the amount of money going to sidewalk repair as a result of people talking about how important it is to fix our sidewalks. Um, we reduced, uh, we, we came to agreement with the city council, consensus agreement, to reduce the business license tax to make it more attractive for us to compete against uh, cities uh, that have been taking jobs from us in the region. Um, we, we are going to be hiring firefighters, which we hadn't done for five years, right? The, the demand is so pent up, we had 10,000 people apply for the job because uh, we haven't hired anyone in five years. Those are the incremental steps. Now, this year we have an opportunity to make some really bigger steps, but it takes your putting your shoulder to the wheel. So let me be very clear about this empowerment piece. There's a difference between input and participation. Most people use those two interchangeably. Well, I want, to, I want to participate in the budget process. I want you to listen to my input. There's a real difference between the two. Input is when you say, my opinion is 10,000 cops is not important to me. I want more money for the library. Well, thank you very much. That's one opinion out of 3.8 million opinions. Participation is when you bring your passion and your opinion and your knowledge and you get together and talk with all the other 3.8 million people in this city and we come together and find common answers. That's participation. That's what today is about. It's not about individual opinions. It's about working together across these 95 neighborhood councils that represent thousands of residents across the city and coming to common ground. That is power. Individual opinions are not power. Individual opinions that are well informed, individual opinions that are willing to sit down and collaborate with other people, individual people who are willing to spend hundreds of hours talking to their colleagues and their compatriots and sitting through those sometimes boring meetings and coming up with good suggestions and then advocating for them forcefully and writing letters to the newspaper and testifying in front of the city council and being advocates. That is power. So if you expect that you come here, you go home, you write a letter, and you think you're done, unfortunately that's naive. It'd be nice if the world worked that way, right? But it doesn't work that way. Democracy requires constant committee meetings. <laughs> there was a, a cartoon in the New Yorker a while ago. Uh, a, young, a young boy was in the park looking up at, at a statue but instead of a general on a horse, there was a, a group of people standing around in, in business suits, men and women. And uh, the boy looks up to his dad and the dad explains, son, there are no great men anymore, just great committees. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's not glamorous work. 
But it's important work. It's important that we fix our streets. It's important our streets are safe. It's important that kids can go to a library and it's open. Do you know what the biggest growth in library services is in the city of Los Angeles today? It's teenagers parking in the parking lot after the library closes to take advantage of the free Wi-Fi that they don't have at home. What we do here is really important. It's not glamorous, but this is about empowerment. So take the survey, check out the opengov.com um, website on the mayor's performance website that has information on the budget going back five years. Uh, check out the controller's uh, dashboard, LA, which is a terrific site. You can drill down and get every single expenditure down to you know 10 bucks, basically. Uh, that the city makes. Um, come to the uh, budget town halls we're going to organize. Uh, read the blogs. Uh, be, be involved in this process and you will have an impact. Poco a poco, we will become the great city we know we can be. But it's going to take all of us together. We focus on performance. We collaborate together. And that way we empower the citizens of Los Angeles, as the mayor says, to partner to build a greater city. That's what today's about. You should be proud that you're here. But as, um, as Jay emphasized, you got to roll up your sleeves and work with some very dedicated people you're going to hear from, like Mr. Krikorian and Mr. Galprin and Mr. Santana. Let's work together. Let's have a budget that we're proud of. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ed Novi. I'm from the Sunland Tahunga Neighborhood Council. This is my fourth year that I've served as a budget advocate, and this is also my last day as uh, serving as a budget advocate. You can tell from Rick's speech that he really is connected now with this process. I'm honored, though, to introduce the next speaker, who comes from our background. He used to be part of a neighborhood council. He was a neighborhood council budget advocate when I first became a budget advocate, and I learned a lot from him. Now he is our city controller. He is going to be one of our best friends during this budget process during this year. He's introduced new methods, new ways to do data mining, so there is no excuse for any of you to actually go online and see how the city spends its money. So I'm pretty proud, very honored, to introduce our city controller, Ron Gelprin. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here for uh, another one of the uh, Neighborhood Council Budget Days. Uh, it, was, it was one of these days, actually, that got me uh, really jazzed and, uh, dare I say, obsessed with the uh, budget of the city of Los Angeles. One thing led to another, and I now find myself, uh, of course, controller of the city. So who knows, uh, the, the next controller of the city may be sitting in, the, uh, in, in this room at this very moment. Uh, because. The whole process was one in which I really got to learn so much more about the finances of the city and about their complexity. And nothing is ever as it quite appears to be, uh, but this is the opportunity to really kind of learn a great deal about, about our finances, where our money comes from, where it's going, and a tremendous opportunity, I think, for neighborhood councils who have that on-the-ground information to actually, and the relationships as well, to actually see that our money is put to good use. Uh, the controller's office, as you might know, does a number of different things. Um, we do financial reporting. We manage the uh, so-called FMS system, which is uh, the system that, that uh, does a lot of the financial transactions of the city. Um, we do the vendor payments. Uh, we've got payroll that we do, just doing payroll for the city's vast uh, uh, 
number of employees and to do it accurately uh, with kind of an older system is, uh, is, is almost miraculous sometimes, I think. But we have a really great group of people who work in the controller's office. We've got about 150 people uh, that do all of these things, and many of them are incredible wonks uh, and, and really dedicated to what they do, which, which I'm really very, very proud of. We've also got our waste, fraud, and abuse unit. And we have also the audits that we do. The audits often sort of get the most attention, although interestingly enough, in terms of the uh, number of staff that we have in the controller's office, it's the smallest number that actually go to doing the auditing. But what we're really trying to do is also not just audits, but really look at the numbers in a variety of ways. You can do white papers, you can do all sorts of reports that are short of auditing that really can enlighten and inform us on, on how we spend our money. Being the guy who came from uh, the outside, and this is my first elective office, uh, having been in business and having been an attorney for many years, uh, my, uh, my other obsession besides the city budget uh, remains uh, looking at ROI, return on investment for absolutely everything that we do. Not that everything necessarily can be quantified in that way, not that we can compare ourselves to the private sector or that we can or should be like a private business in every way, but we are running one very big business here, let's face it. And uh, what we have to do is find a way to, uh, to do it as efficiently as possible. But I, I had mentioned that nothing is as it ever appears to be. For example, we're doing an audit right now of workers' comp for the city. And we're talking about somewhere around $200 million a year in workers' comp. The lion's share of it is for uh, police and for fire. And you can look at the numbers, and we're crunching them in all sorts of different ways. We're looking at uh, the age distribution of different types of injuries. Uh, we're looking at uh, the types of injuries themselves, all sorts of things, comparing ourselves to other jurisdictions. But yesterday, I also spent some time at a, at a fire station and then went out on a, uh, on a call for a, uh, for a fire, actually, that was nearby. And then you stand there and you breathe the fumes of the trucks. You actually pick up the, uh, the hoses. You actually pick up the equipment that is being carried and you begin to understand a little bit more about the various types of injuries that can occur and some of the things both micro and macro that can and should be done to avoid these kind of injuries both for the welfare of, of our firefighters, but also the bottom line of the city of LA because it gets very expensive, needless to say. Um, what you're seeing here is our control panel, and this is uh, the open data site that we've got, and of course the mayor's office has been working a great deal on, on open data and on metrics and been doing some great work on that. Uh, and what we really wanted to do was to democratize with as few committee meetings as possible, uh, democratize the, the data of the city and to really open that up to anybody to look at 24 hours a day. So you've got information on the money that comes in, the money that goes out, tremendous detail about payroll. I think many of you have been on this site, but if you haven't, I really welcome you to do that. Big data, of course, does not translate necessarily into intelligent or meaningful data. I will be the first one to say. Uh, you, can, you can look at some of the numbers, and that which looks absolutely benign can, in fact, be really problematic. That which looks really problematic can, in fact, be absolutely benign. I remember when we put this out and we got a, a phone call immediately from uh, somebody in the media saying, why is the city paying money to Rolls-Royce? Who's driving a Rolls Royce in the city of Los Angeles? By the way, it's not me. Uh, and of course, they make uh, uh, commercial engine parts, and, and we've got lots of engines, including for uh, helicopters, and uh, they had the part that we needed, and it, it was a necessary part. So you have to look beyond just the data itself. But having said that, if you don't look at that data, then you don't really begin to, to have a full understanding of where our money is being spent. Now, along those lines, one of the data sets that we put up, and, and sort of in the parlance of the world of data, even I continue to learn the terminology each and every day, uh, but we put uh, up data sets. 
And uh, among the data sets that we put up is one for special funds. Now, special funds, there are about 900 of these. Uh, everybody's familiar, of course, with the general fund, but there's also all these special funds. And they actually are for a whole variety of purposes. They can be for business improvements districts. They can even be for, there's a special fund, by the way, for coral tree trimming on San Vicente Boulevard in Brentwood. It's a fund just for that purpose and nothing else. Only coral trees, not any other kind of trees. Now, uh, the reason that these are so important, however, is that they represent about 89% of the treasury of the city, which is around $8 billion, give or take, a few million or a few tens of millions of dollars at any given moment. And they're a real opportunity to see what are the specific sources of these funds, how are they being used, and, and we've been using actually audits to kind of look at that and identify opportunities. So for example, we did a, an audit of the 1% for art fee, and that's the 1% that is paid by developers for art when they do certain kind of commercial projects. Now they can do that art on site, or they can pay toward this fund. So we found a great deal of money that was sitting in this fund and it was unspent. And we began to sort of ask the questions, well, why is this the case? And we could have sort of criticized, which we did to some extent, admittedly, um, the, um, the Department of Cultural Affairs for letting that money sit around. But it wasn't by accident altogether that that happened. There had been a previous interpretation of the law by previous uh, city attorney that said, well, that money could only be spent within one block. And what happened was is that there were many, many uh, deposits of money that were put in there that there was absolutely no way that that money could be spent within one block. So there it sat. And we looked at what the current ordinance was and we said, well, you can force compliance, as it were, with the current ordinance, but that's not going to do anything. In fact, that might be counterproductive. And so what we did is work with the city attorney's office as well as with the council to see that that ordinance is actually going to be changed. And that will free up that money, which has already been paid, to do something useful with. Because quite frankly, the developers pay that money in good faith, and the neighborhoods and the communities want to see that money spent as well. So nobody wins when it just kind of sits there. Not to say that there's this huge gold mine of unspent money that all of a sudden is going to solve all of our budget problems tomorrow, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's a way to help find some money that might not otherwise be put to its best use. Uh, we also just recently completed an audit of the uh, foreclosure registry program of the city of LA. And in some ways, this was sort of a similar theme that we found. These, there are monies that have been collected, but there's also a great deal of money that has not been collected. And we kind of looked at the ordinance and one that had been sort of designed with really good intentions to try and prevent blight and to try and hold parties responsible for properties that are going downhill that are in foreclosure. But some real problems with the way that it was structured in the first place. And again, I, I want to give kudos to a number of folks who are in the city council that we've been working with that are going to be reforming and changing the ordinance uh, so that it can actually be doing what it's supposed to do in the first place. Uh, and we mentioned, of course, the workers' comp, and, and that's an ongoing issue. We've been doing a number of different audits about that, about how we administrate that, because it is a great deal of money for the city. You might have also heard about our, uh, oh, by the way, what do we have up here? This is our, our control panel, which you can see, and there are, I think, several different windows that are here. This one is, what are we looking at right now? Ah, this is the balance of funds, okay. So these are the special funds that we were talking about. Uh, street services, we just recently uh, uh, completed an audit on that. There's also an infographic that you're gonna be seeing coming up on this. One of the things that we're looking for is how do we take data and how do we take our own audits and make them uh, visualized and understandable in a variety of different ways. Because I'd love to believe that each and every one of you are going to read all 100 pages of that audit. <laughs> I'd like to believe that everybody in the city council is going to read all 100 pages of that audit. Uh, but that may not happen. So 
And, and they've got a lot of things to do, admittedly. So uh, what, we, what we try to do is to make sure that, that there are good summaries of the things that we're putting out, uh, that uh, we also have infographics that make it easy to look at some of the most important things. Uh, as well as uh, more and more we're going to be experimenting with hot mapping and with, with uh, GPS coding of a lot of the data that we have so that you can begin to understand from a geographic, from a visual point of view how the money is being spent. Now, there are about 6,500 uh, so-called center line miles and about 28,000 uh, lane miles of, of road. That's sort of the equivalent, interestingly enough, of a 10-lane highway from LA to New York. And that's a lot of streets that need to be kept up. And we know that there are a lot of issues that uh, relate to this. And we looked at a three-year period. It was the period that actually ended in the last completed fiscal year when we came out with this, which was for uh, June 30th of 2013. This is actually right before the, uh, the new mayor came in. And everybody who drives our roads knows that we've got problems. And about 40% of our streets, my own included, I might add, uh, get a D or an F grade. Uh, there's a real issue, though, as I think we all know, that how do we find the money to fix this? And I don't know that I have the answer to this, but when you look at the fact that statistically we pay about 71% more per year as Angelinos in terms of vehicle maintenance costs or additional vehicle maintenance costs compared to others around the country, we're already sort of paying for our lack of improvement of the streets. And what we really do need to do is find a way over the course of the next couple of years to find a, a vehicle to actually pay for that. But one thing that we did look at uh, was the ever so sexy subject of SDRF, uh, which is uh, street damage restoration fees. And we have a number of recommendations around that and, and monies that we believe can be uh, better collected in order to make sure that those who are cutting into our streets actually pay for it. Uh, or that we avoid seeing some of those things happen in terms of timing because how many of us have seen a street repaved and then two weeks later it got torn up? Uh, so there is some new software. There's a number of things actually that are being employed by the Bureau uh, of Street Services, but, but we really believe that, and I know the mayor was here earlier talking about technology. It's not the panacea, it's not the answer to all the problems that, that we have in the city, but it is the answer to a lot of problems that we have right now, and we've got to bring ourselves into the 21st century. Um, I, I'm just going to sort of uh, conclude by saying that uh, it's wonderful that everybody is here today. Uh, there's so many things you could be doing, and here you are listening to talk about the budget and about finances of the city. Uh, and. Um, you could be outside and, and, and uh, enjoying the, the weather, but here we are talking about what it is that it takes to make our city actually work, the nuts and bolts of it and the, uh, the finances of it. And without you being here and being advocates, the, the reality is that there's a bit of a box in, in city government. And it's hard for people sometimes to get out of that box. And your job, among other things, is to sort of be invading that box, helping to break that box apart, helping to sometimes drag people out of that box and into the community, and to uh, really not just be engaged, but to be engaging everybody who's in city government uh, in what it's going to take to really reinvent and reinvigorate uh, and to innovate our government. And uh, I'm deeply grateful for what I have learned from all of my fellow budget advocates and for the work that I know that you're going to be doing. And wanted to thank very much the organizers and uh, give kudos to the mayor's uh, office and to, uh, uh, to uh, CAO and to uh, the others who are making presentations today and to uh, the council. I think ne up next is uh, actually going to be the... Uh, fantastic chair of our budget and finance uh, committee, and that is uh, Councilmember Krikorian. But I think somebody else is introducing you, so I don't want to steal that thunder. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Controller Galpern. So he did introduce Councilmember Krikorian, so I guess I don't need to be up here, but <laughs> I, I will say I was given a four and a half page bio of Councilman Corian, but 
you, you're happy to know that I'm not going to be reading that, but I do want to make a few comments. Um, first of all, having served as a budget advocate for two years from 2011 to 13, um, and to let you know there is life after being a budget advocate, um, that I had the pleasure of working with Councilman Kokorian first as um, in his capacity as being chair of the Education and Neighborhoods Committee, which for those of you that don't know, oversees all the policies that affect neighborhood councils. It goes through that committee before it goes to city council. And then in 2012, uh, Councilman Kokorian became chair of the Budget and Finance Committee, which is uh, this capacity of being here today. Um, I just wanted to so say, though, that this is a wonderful model, in my opinion, that anyone who becomes chair of Budget and Finance Committee, it should be a prerequisite that you be chair of education and neighborhoods from the perspective of neighborhood councils, because it gives you a great understanding. And just know that Councilman Corian was a great advocate for neighborhood councils when the issue of restoring our rollover monies from that period when we had that opportunity. And really to save the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment when it was proposed to be um, closed down and, Anna and incorporated into a different department. So that was a, a, a key. And then moving to heading up the Budget and Finance Committee, which is you know the committee that oversees from the mayor's proposed budget and has to deal with all the input and not just of neighborhood council folks, but of course, you know, the, all the stakeholders of the city, the unions, and everyone else is affected by, by the budget. And um, so that's a difficult job, and I think Council Member Kokorian uh, has done a great job, and he will tell you about that. But I do want to acknowledge that in just a year and three months into his job as a new council member and the effectiveness that he did, that he earned the... Um, award of the Valley Alliance of Neighborhood Councils in receiving the Got It Award in very quickly in your work. So we're to look forward to maybe giving you another one for the Budget and Finance Committee work. So Council Member Kokorian. Thank you, Glenn, very much. What a generous introduction. I very much appreciate it. And good morning, everybody. It, well, wait, let me check. It is still morning. Yes, it is still morning. Uh, listen, first I just want to um, echo our controller's um, kudos because I'm sitting, I'm standing right now in a room full of my heroes. Uh, you all, first of all, year in and year out, week after week, month after month, are the ones who are doing that very difficult work of grappling with the, some of the most challenging issues that you have in our communities, um, listening to the diverse stakeholders in your own communities, um, and being their voice. And that is hard, hard, thankless, frustrating, often work. It's also sometimes very rewarding when you see the, the positive uh, results of it, but it's difficult work. And you're all doing that because of the degree that you care about your community and when you take all those communities together, how much you care about our city. And so um, under any circumstances, I'd be grateful to you and thankful to you for that. But then added to that, at a time when in this city, we're lucky if we can get one out of 10 people to show up and vote in city elections. You are the people who are not only committing your time and energy and leadership uh, to your neighborhoods throughout the year, but you're here on a beautiful Saturday listening to elected officials talking about analytics and data and budgets, which it, voluntarily, which is almost incomprehensible to me. I have to do that. That's part of my job. But, uh, so I, I really think this is, uh, it's, it's heroic uh, what you're doing. And um, trust me when I tell you, it really, really matters a lot and especially right at this moment in our city's history. Uh, because this is a, a remarkable time of transition for our city. It's been a, the roughest time that most of us can remember over this last half decade. And um, we're just starting now to emerge from that, um, and it's time to start really rethinking the way uh, 
we deliver services. Uh, we, it's time to rethink the way this city uh, should govern and should, should, uh, should deliver services to its constituents. And you need to be a central part of that discussion. And so that's why this dialogue is, is really key. So I want to start by giving you kind of a, um, an overview of the path that we've taken for the last five years. Because clearly there's a lot of good news uh, to be sure, and I want to share that with you, but I also want to share with you that it isn't all good news, and we have to still be um, as tempted as we are to say, well, fix this and fix that and do this other stuff. Um, we do still have to be mindful about the fiscal limitations that the city is going to face for several years to come now. So it's we have to temper our optimism with the reality that we are still facing um, some significant challenges. Um, oh, and speaking of significant challenges, before I go any further, I do also want to recognize and thank the president of the Board of Public Works, Kevin James, who is here, and thank you for having us here today in your, in your beautiful boardroom. I just have to say, Ron, uh, mentioned the the streets audit that he had done. One thing I can assure you is the president of our Board of Public Works has read all 100 of those pages and has a few very salient thoughts about some of its contents, which uh, he'll be going over uh, with, the, with the city council. Um, so just to put it into a context, when I, I it seems like a week ago, but I'm, now that I realize that I've been on the council now for four years, which never ceases to amaze me. Uh, but when I was elected in 2000, when I took office in 2010, um, it was in the, the worst, darkest moment of the recession after the w global economy had collapsed just two years ago, the two years earlier. And at that time, when I uh, was sworn in, uh, the city was projecting a budget deficit for the current fiscal year that we're in right now of $1.1 billion dollars. Now when you consider that the general fund is a little over four, like four and a half billion dollars and we were looking at a 1.1 billion dollar deficit, it's mind-boggling. The magnitude of that challenge is absolutely mind-boggling. Particularly when you add to that that two-thirds of the discretionary spending of the city is for cops and firefighters. So if you take away what we're mandated to pay uh, if you take away cops, you take away firefighters, you're left with a little sliver of the budget, about 30% or so of the budget to, to play with in achieving a 25% budget reduction. It's, it's just mind-boggling. We could have eliminated entire departments and still not um, completed all that. So there was no way that that was going to happen in a single blow. Um, Rick Cole mentioned his uh, poco a poco slogan. That's what happened. We started down that path and um, started chipping away at that and achieved a number of, of things uh, to bring that uh, number down. Um, we cert first of all reduced our workforce dramatically. And, many, and you've all experienced, unfortunately, the results of that, because with fewer people comes fewer and slower services. But the city now has the smallest workforce that we've had since Tom Bradley was mayor. Now, the demands on those workers have not decreased. Uh, they, they've certainly gone way up in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, but still, we've had a reduced workforce, and that's why you see these very long and unacceptable delay times in many of the services that um, you all deserve. We've, we eliminated 5,000 positions, people working to, to trim trees and to fix streets and to work in our libraries and um, all of those things. So um, it, it was a very, very dramatic reduction. We established new pension tiers for sworn and civilian employees to reduce long-term pension costs. Um, we did eliminate and consolidate a number of uh, departments, but one of them uh, was not going to be the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. And that was one of the ones that was on the chopping block. And we, we made sure that that didn't happen. And I think we've been proven right by when we see how great Dunn has, has been doing, how Dunn has been doing over the, over the last uh, few years with the support of, of all of you. Um, so 
reduction in the workforce, uh, pension reform, uh, cost efficiencies, um, and striving for new sources of revenue. And, and you're going to be hearing from Fernando Campos, our Inspector General on, on, uh, on collections. Ron Galperin, before he was controller, was doing uh, wonderful work on finding new, with many of you, on finding new ways to be more effective in collecting what the city is owed. And so through all of that, that $1.1 billion was chipped away, chipped away, chipped away, chipped away, and then when we faced this year's budget uh, deliberations, that number had been reduced from $1.1 billion to under $250 million. And so, and at the same time, we increased the reserve fund to the largest it had ever been in the city's modern history. So we would never have to go through this you know, horror again of facing rapidly increasing costs with no money to pay for it when our revenues decline. So we have this very healthy reserve fund. We added a budget stabilization fund to find, to give us even more of a cushion for uh, the rainy days. And uh, with all of that, we eliminated that $1.1 billion and achieved uh, balance for this year's budget. But, but, the, the downside of that is that we, you know, when you look at the out years, we still have uh, much more work to do in trying to eliminate those ongoing structural deficits in the, uh, in the future, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so let me talk a little bit, oh, well, actually, before I do, um, we're projecting, right, I should be watching these screens, I guess, so I know where I'm, what I'm supposed to be talking about. Oh, okay, yeah, there we go. Um, this is a very interesting uh, chart because a lot of times people ask the basic question, where does the city get its money? And um, if you're facing a deficit, why don't you just, you know, go collect more or raise some tax or something? And this gives you an idea of the diverse sources of revenues that the city relies upon. Biggest one, of course, is property tax. Then comes, you know, recovery of costs through licenses and permits and fees and fines for those who are uh, ne'er-do-wells. Um, the utility users tax, the business tax, the sales tax, um, the, the power revenue transfer, uh, which I'd be happy to talk to you about, anybody who needs more information about that, documentary transfer tax, and the TOT, which is um, the hotel tax. And then you see everybody's favorite down at 3% of total revenue is parking fines. Uh, and then Everything else combined is 8%. Now, what's especially notable about this, and this gives you a sense of why we had such a tough time from 2008 forward, is look at all the biggest sources of revenues. Property tax, utility users tax, business tax, sales tax. All of those forms of revenue are exceptionally sensitive to economic change. If there's a little hiccup in the economy, if there's unemployment, so on, all of a sudden, you know, if people are, if people's houses are being foreclosed upon, obviously your property tax re uh, revenue is not going to be going up. Um, if people are, you know, shutting down businesses, we're receiving less in utility users tax and business tax. If people have no confidence in the future of their regional economy or in the, the strength of their own employment, they're certainly not going to be going out and making the kind of big expenditures that produce sales tax. So for all those reasons, we're much more than most cities in America, by the way. We are exceptionally dependent on economically sensitive revenue sources. In most parts of the country, let's face it, we have the benefit here as a people of Proposition 13 and the protections that that gives us in our property right. But the other side of that coin is that we also have lower property tax revenues than most other parts of the country do, and therefore we're more dependent upon these other sources of revenue like sales tax, which can be you know, lost in a heartbeat. So um, before we get to that, um, the, I, I mentioned the out years and how we still have to continue to work hard, and, and I'll conclude with that, but I, just the one thing you should know is um, we've, we've come to a good budget this year. It's a balanced budget. As Rick Cole mentioned, it was a very collaborative effort with the mayor and with all of you, but it didn't finish the job. 
and we still have structural deficits in the out year. We expect that by on, we're currently on pace with revenue projections and um, if we continue to hold the line on cost uh, increases that we should be on track to entirely eliminate the structural deficit uh, once and for all by 2018. So, uh, but we're not quite there yet. So what are we doing this year's budget? All of you, I think, um, made very clear, the entire city made clear, that before the city does anything else, the city needs to keep its people safe. And so the first priority for, uh, always is on public safety. And uh, Rick mentioned the hiring of firefighters. This is monumental because our fire department has been decimated uh, during these budget cuts and, and even before, frankly. And so this was the first year in, since I've been here where we really started to put money back in the fire department, started to rebuild our fire department. We uh, budgeted $22 million uh, of increased spending in the fire department, six and a half million of that to hire new firefighters, which helps reduce uh, response time and helps to deal with the attrition that, that we have. And then uh, over three million for life-saving fire safety equipment, another five million to keep more ambulances on the street um, and, and so forth. So we've really committed, my first priority and I think that of most of you and, and most of my colleagues is fix the fire department first. Police department, we've had incredible success uh, at a time of economic uncertainty, which is the time, the sort of time that you usually see spiking crime rates. Um, we have had in this city declining crime rates for each of the last 10 consecutive years. It's, it's just an amazing success story. Uh, and so we didn't want to upset the apple cart on that uh, now when we're doing so well. So we're maintaining police hiring uh, at its current levels. And then we started the, the big job of chipping away at police, at accrued police overtime. And I know many of you raise this issue a lot. It is a big issue. There's a, a big bank of overtime that's owed to police officers uh, because we're um, we've, we've got more of them out on the street than, than can really be accommodated by our current uh, level of 9,900 cops. So we have to rely on overtime, but we can't afford to pay for the overtime, so they bank it. So we have a huge accrued liability for uh, banked overtime. We're chipping away at that with $30 million invested in paying that down. And the reason that it's so important that you eliminate that and pay it down and get rid of that bank is because overtime under state law for cops or any of you, if you accrue overtime, you get paid whenever you get paid that at your current rate of pay. So if that accrues for 10 years and you get 10 years of raises, guess what? When you get paid that overtime that you earned 10 years ago, you're going to get paid it at time and a half of your then current rate. So that's why the value of this just just skyrockets. And, and by the way, add into, bless you, add into that promotions and everything else. So it's a, it's a huge problem and we're chipping away with, at it now. It's going to be another big part of the continuing discussion that we have with our police officers right now. And you know that that negotiation is going on. I'm not going to talk about that at all. But just know that dealing with police overtime is going to be a big priority that we're going to have. And we got more uh, vehicles on, on the road as well with, uh, uh, with black and whites. Very important for all of you. You know how important your neighborhood prosecutors are in dealing with the quality of life issues in your neighborhood that you're banging your head against the wall about. And you say, why doesn't somebody do something? The neighborhood prosecutor program has been a godsend for our communities. Um, but unfortunately, we haven't had enough of them to go around. So Mike Fewer came to me and he said, if there's one thing we can do in our budget, let's get more neighborhood prosecutors. I I agreed, and so uh, we were able to fund eight more neighborhood prosecutors. So there's a neighborhood; pr there will be a neighborhood prosecutor in every division in the city uh, now to help to deal with some of the challenges that you have. All right, moving on. The controller mentioned street repair. We budgeted uh, for 2,400 miles of street repair, which is almost a 10% increase. Uh, over the previous year, uh, we budgeted for 350,000 uh, potholes to be repaired and another 5 million to clean up alleys and streets. And importantly, 
the long festering, long ignored challenge of fixing the city's sidewalks. Um, the mayor budgeted um, $20 million in, in the proposed budget, which was uh, terrific. We, we worked with the mayor in, in budgeting $20 million. One thing that was um, concerning to me is that we had budgeted $10 million and appropriated $10 million the previous year, but only $3 million of it had been spent because we just didn't have a policy in place to figure out how to prioritize it and spend it quickly enough to spend it before the fiscal year. So I made clear that whatever was unspent was going to be spent on sidewalks and rolled over into the coming year. So this fiscal year we have $27 million set aside for sidewalk repair. And that's <clears throat> that hasn't happened in years. Now, the next step in that process, bless you, uh, the next step in that process, though, is it's one thing to say, here's the money. It's another thing that, to say, now what do you do with the money? Because, you know, if I asked, if there's 100 people in this room and I asked each of you, what's the most important thing to do in sidewalk repair? I'd get about 105 answers. Um, most of them would say, well, you know, look at my neighborhood, look at the area around our park, look at the, you know, broken sidewalk in front of our library. Another would say, I can't deal with this because, you know, I have a disability and I have to, you know, have access to uh, curb cuts. And so, so there's, there's many different ways to do this. We're going to be uh, evaluating all of these policies and I have a comprehensive sidewalk repair uh, proposal uh, that I'm working on with with the chair of our uh, public works committee, Joe Buscaino. That's going to be heard in a joint committee of the budget, a joint meeting of the budget and public works committee on Monday. So if any of you can make it, I have flyers out there for you. 1.30 on Monday uh, in council chambers, uh, we're going to be having a long, long discussion about sidewalks and how we fix them. It's, it's, it, just so you know, this is about a billion dollar job. And it's not going to happen in one year, it's not going to happen in five years. But we have to start now the process of building for a 20 or 30 year long program to get it done once and for all throughout in every single neighborhood in the city and that's what we're going to be working on. All right, a um, couple of other things in terms of infrastructure that we've been investing in uh, that are important uh, for our quality of life. Neighborhood beautification, we have over three million dollars in the budget for medians and graffiti abatement and so on and um, more funding for our parks. And uh, uh, library restoration, we're adding hours to our libraries. Um, uh, and, uh, oh, and senior meals. Senior meals is an important one uh, that I just want to mention. You know, because of the stagnation in Washington, uh, much of this, the basic social service stuff that, that means a difference almost really of life or death for the people in our city is being hung up because of federal inaction. Much of that comes from, it's called CDBG funding that comes from the federal government. And when, when we have all these sequesters, when we have the budget gridlock that they have, we don't get that funding. And there's no place else to go for it. So um, we actually had to dig in deeper into other programs uh, and make sure that we uh, continue to backfill some of those expenditures. So as a result of that work, we had um, over a million dollars that we spent of city money that wouldn't otherwise have been spent just for senior meals uh, and caregivers. And this, you know, is over 100,000 meals for our most vulnerable, neediest seniors uh, throughout the city. So that, that's, I, th I think that's a pretty good expenditure of funds uh, compared to some of the things that we do. And uh, finally, you know, ch changing, uh, yeah, a couple of other things. Um, good government. The controller has talked about his use of data and the, the mayor has emphasized this. Uh, this is all really important and it all takes money. And so we've worked in partnership with the mayor's office and the controller to ensure that we're upgrading our systems around budgeting to make our budget more accessible, to make uh, information more available both to you and to the necessary decision makers. We gave the controller another half million dollars uh, to conduct uh, the important audits that uh, he's going to continue to work on because we believe in the importance of that uh, process. Uh, and we've spent 
three quarters of a million dollars on a new uh, risk management system. And uh, the city attorney has devoted considerable effort now to figuring out why are we paying the money that we're paying in these huge lawsuits and how instead of paying it at the back end, how can we prevent it from happening in the front end? And that's a critical cost-saving measure. Uh, we're going to be spending a lot of time working with the city attorney on that. We funded uh, his efforts to do that. Um, and then, of course, $350,000 for more open data of the kind the controller was talking about. So all of that being said, I just want to leave you with a uh, final thought. This is, it's all good news in that we've overcome a lot over the last few years. But I, I really want you to come away from this with, with three critical takeaways. One is that th these last five years, this was a real thing. So when you know, the blogosphere and whatever says, you know, kind, kind of bashes the city and talks about, you know, well, you know, we're, we're just a bunch of bumbling fools who you know, don't know how to spend the taxpayers' money. Look, everybody on planet Earth suffered because of the 2008 financial crisis. Every state, every city in our country had to go through a complete reconfiguration of what they were spending when the economic uh, state of our country went over the edge of the table. And um, so this was a real thing that had to be dealt with in a crisis way. And I'm pleased to say the next takeaway is that we've really gotten past the crisis. We solved the biggest part of those problems. Um, and that is terrific news. But we're not quite done yet. We have more to do. And the, the final takeaway is how important you are in that process. Because this is an amazing moment of transition with our new mayor, our new controller, our new city attorney, a new majority on the city council. Um, and right at the very time when we're coming out of the darkest part of the recession and revenues are starting to go up and we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. It is a wonderful time of rethinking and transition in our city and you must be a part of that. Your ideas are so important to how we reshape what our city looks like. Your engagement is so important to make sure that we're implementing the things that you want us to implement. So I want to urge you to be continue to be involved, continue to be involved in the budget process, continue to let the mayor's office know what metrics are important to you to measure our success. You know, what are the things that you want to be restored first? Um, and if you do that, I really think that um, these next few years are going to be a tremendous time in the history of this city when we look back and we say that was the time when we all got it, uh, the time when we all figured out uh, how to do the hard things that people have ignored for too many decades, and we put the city on a strong foundation for its future throughout the 21st century. So we're on our way. We've got more work to do. Thank you all very, very much for being a part of it. Good morning. I'm Barbara Ringette, a budget rep from the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council and a budget advocate this past year. City Administrative Officer Miguel A. Santana oversees the City of Los Angeles $7.7 billion budget with 20 plus years experience in leadership and management of fiscal, legislative, political, and community issues. Mr. Santana served as Deputy Executive Officer for the County of Los Angeles, the largest county in the United States, and managed oversight of all the county's social service departments, including the Department of Children and Family Services, public social services, child support, military and veterans affairs, and the Human Relations Commission. Collectively, these departments represented $9 billion of the $22 billion annual county budget. Mr. Santana has a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University. He serves on the boards of several nonprofit organizations, including MALDEF, the Washington based Latino Leaders Network, LA Plaza Caltura y Artes, 
and United Way of Greater Los Angeles. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Los Angeles City Administrative Officer Miguel Santana. Good morning. Whenever I come to this room, I feel like I'm at church. Um, yeah, it, it, I am, right. So I grew up Catholic as a kid, and um, one of my favorite parts of church was when we got to stand up and sit down, because that meant it was almost over. And so, borrowing from that tradition, why don't you guys all stand up? So, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, you can sit down now. Okay, see, that means that we're almost done. <laughs> so one of my favorite parts of my job, and I do have many favorite parts, is that I get to spend two weeks uh, traveling around the country meeting with in investors. and. Uh, I start off in Baltimore and work my way up to New Hampshire and then to San Francisco and Chicago. And I've been doing that since I first got here five years ago. And the story that we have to share with them is the story of a city that encountered some of the darkest days in its history, but has over time experienced significant recovery. Um, I've gotten to know many of the investors over that time, they, they're the same ones. I also get an opportunity to meet with the bond rating agencies. And I got to tell you, when I first started this process, they were very skeptical. Uh, they asked, you know, they would last two or three hours apiece with the intensity of questions that they asked. They all came in with their various articles from the LA Times and New York Times and various showing that we're the next big city that was ready to fall off the cliff into bankruptcy. And this last time we did it, um, just a few months ago, it was very different. Uh, they, they could tell our story almost as well as we can tell it. And the reason it is, is because we're asking them to invest in our city. All of us who live in LA, we don't have a choice, we have to pay taxes. And so whether we like it or not, whether we agree with who's, who's in City Hall or not, we're required to pay. People around the country who are asking to invest in us has to make a choice. And so the, their understanding of the city has evolved because the city itself has evolved. So I wanted to share with you some of the questions that they ask as we're traveling because it's some of the questions all of you should be asking as residents of this city and who pay taxes and who should expect a level of service uh, that represents how significant and important this city is. The, the most important question that they ask is, so what have you learned? We experience, again, some very difficult days and, and Mr. Krikorian was here during that time and played a critical role in getting us in a much stronger place. But this is also a very dangerous time because we're in a place where either we can learn from those lessons of the past or we can make the same mistakes that a few years in from now when the next recession hit, and there will be another recession at some point, we go back to the way things were. And so the question I get asked, so what have you learned? You know, what has, this, what has the elected leadership learned? What has the public learned about that time? And how are they going to make sure those, those mistakes don't made again? And this is how I respond. I think what's very important as you sat here and listened to the mayor, to his staff, to the council, uh, the budget chair, the controller, no one's talking about the fact that we don't have a problem. Everybody recognizes that the city has come a long way, but it's always stated in a context that we're still not done yet. And so when investors hear that, they get reassured that we're not pretending like everything's rosy. And there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic. 
we haven't seen this many cranes in, in the city since the last major boom. Our budget from last year to this year went up five and a half percent. That's a significant increase from one year to the next. Crime is at historic lows. People are starting to invest in the city again. All of our property values are increasing. Every single one of our revenue sources are, are on the upswing. Historic number of visitors coming to Los Angeles, and the mayor talked about the fact that we're one of the top brands in, in, in the world. And so some could say it's time to go back to the way things were. But I haven't heard one single one of my 16 bosses say that. They all want to make sure that we make the right choices and the right decisions to come out stronger still three or four years from now. So how is that represented? The city has maintained the workforce flat. When I tell investors that even though our budget grew by 5.5% and yet our workforce is the same size it was from when we first originally had to cut it, they're shocked. Because nobody runs for office saying, guess what, I'm going to keep the workforce flat. They run for office wanting to provide better services. But the elected leadership we have is so committed to learning from the lessons of the past that they're slowly restoring services in a responsible way, in a, in a way that results in greater efficiencies and looking at alternative approaches, such as in public-private partnerships, what we did at the convention center, and, and finding ways to ask fundamentally, so what is our job as a city? What is it that only we can do? It is those questions that then result in the kind of restoration that takes place in the future. The other major signal that we've learned from the past is that we actually have the biggest reserves we've had in a very, very long time. Okay, so we got downgraded not just once but twice in the height of the recession. And, when, and it, when the bond rate agencies downgrade you, that means it's like lowering your credit score. So when you go out and borrow, which we do in good times and bad, it's more expensive. And the number one reason they downgraded us is because we had to dip into our savings account to end the year in the black. It is a very dangerous thing to do when you see a city say, you know, I'm running out of cash. I have to go after my one-time money to be able to keep the lights on and pay my mortgage. If our, if our own children said that, we would not be very happy. And so we had to do that as a city. And as a result, we were downgraded twice. When that happened, the city made a commitment that even in the worst of the recession, we had to start building up our reserves. And the city has done that. Are we have a base level commitment, a policy to have a reserve fund of 5%. We've exceeded that. And we continue to grow it. It's an important part of managing any budget. You, there's a lot of debate out there saying, well, why not use the reserve fund to pave your streets? The equivalent of that is saying, why not buy a new car with an annual uh, payment, a monthly payment of $500, and take it out of your savings account for the first three payments. Okay, what happens after those first three payments? You're stuck with that continual payment and you already wiped out your savings account. And so it's important to maintain a savings account that's responsible while at the same time uh, building back services uh, slowly and in a controlled way. And this shows how we've been able to build up that reserve fund. Our goal is to have a reserve fund that's 10% of the general fund. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen within the next couple years. But if you have a reserve fund of 10%, then we could all breathe a sigh of relief because guess what? The next recession is going to happen. And instead of talking about layoffs and furloughs and cutting down services, we could rely a little bit on that reserve fund to be able to bridge that moment of crisis. You know, the county of Los Angeles did that. They experienced the same exact recession we experienced. 
and they didn't have a single layoff or a single furlough because they had very healthy reserves and they used a portion of those reserves to bridge that gap. That's what reserves are there, but they have to be high enough where you could do that. And so we're starting to build our way for that. You know, the people who will thank this council and the mayor are people who will be elected a decade from now. And if the people who were here a decade ago thought the same way, we wouldn't have been here. And so that's the biggest difference, that's a significant lesson that this leadership has learned. So the other question they ask, so where are you going? What does all of this mean? Now that you've, now that you've stabilized the city, you're being smarter how you invest, you're building back your reserves, where, where are things going? What does the future look like? And for the first time since I've been here, and I've been here five years, I could actually see the light at the end of the tunnel. We actually could tell you when we no longer have a structural deficit. And trust me, no one is more tired about talking the about the structural deficit than me. You know, it's, it's one of these things that it's just, it's like having gum on your shoe that you never quite get rid of it. And the more you walk, eventually it's gone. And so we have a little bit more to go. Now there's a couple of things that could dramatically change that. Number one, if we start seeing growth in our pension costs, okay? It is, it is also amazing that we actually could start seeing our pension costs le level off. When I show this chart to my colleagues around the country, they're shocked because most of them don't know where it stops. It just keeps on growing. We could actually see, based on the, on the illustrations provided, that when we start peaking and it starts leveling off. Now what changes that if we're not successful in keeping the new pension tier? It was a long fought struggle to adopt a new pension tier in the city, which is currently being challenged. And the city will continue fighting for that pension tier because we want to see that. We want to see it level off. If we don't have a new pension tier, it's harder for us to actually hire new employees because those employees become more expensive. It's also harder for us to invest in other things, in, in the infrastructure that everyone needs and wants. And so making sure our, our pension systems are sustainable is a critical part of that. The other is, the other thing that may change that is if in fact we do experience a recession sooner rather than later. Now our revenue projections based on the deficit projections that you saw are modest. They're a, a three and a half percent growth rate. And the reason we do that is because we don't like to play, uh, uh, you know, a fortune teller. My staff is fairly conservative to say, look, if you look at the last 25 years, 30 years, revenue grows at a steady rate at about three and a half percent. And so instead of trying to figure out, okay, maybe in 2017 there'll be a recession, but in 2015 there'll be a huge boom, we are fairly conservative on how we base it. So if revenue slow down or flatten, we have a, a recession that will have nothing to do with Los Angeles, there'll be something going on in some other part of the world or country that we can't control, then, then that creates a problem. On the other side, if revenues grow faster, than what we projected, which is what happened in the current fiscal year, that actually closed the deficit even more. And so the final question that gets asked is really thinking about the future as a whole, as a city. And what, when, I, when I ask him about that, because many people when, you, when I travel around the country um, haven't been to Los Angeles in a very long time, or the image of LA that they have is not the image that you and I experience. And so I urge them to come to LA to experience all the new restaurants that we have, to, to walk down, you know, I, I lived 20 years in the city of Claremont, you know, 30 miles away from here, and recently moved just down the street in downtown. And I, ha I live with my 22-year-old daughter, who uh, we take turns walking the dog about at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and when she walks the dogs, I, don't, I never worry once 
because LA is at the safety of the city is not just in the numbers that the chief shows us. We all feel what safety feels like. We could, we could sense it in our neighborhoods. Every, every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night, and Sunday night, there's at least three or four things to do for free within walking distance of my neighborhood. That's why we live here, and that's what the future of Los Angeles looks like. So with that, I want to thank all of you guys for the support that you have given the city. None of this happened without your insistence that we be transparent, that we focus on what most matters, and most importantly, that we never forget what it was like so that informs what we do in the future. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, um, my name is Danielle Lafayette and I am the new elected chair of Empowerment Congress West Area Neighborhood Development Council. I am honored to be here to speak with you all today. I was a budget advocate last year. It was my first term as a budget advocate. I would like to begin by acknowledging our Los Angeles City Mayor, Eric Garcetti. I believe that we have a great mayor and I believe that he holds himself accountable as well as his staff and the city accountable for our beautiful city. Mayor Garcetti and I started our terms at the same time. I started last year as a budget advocate and also as the um, correspondent secretary of my neighborhood council. He began his term by implementing the back to basics, metric based and transparent budget for Los Angeles. I joined the budget advocates to become a voice for South Los Angeles, for Baldwin Village and the nickname of my city is the jungle. I soon realized that there is a difference in the English language is spoken throughout the city of Los Angeles between community members, stakeholders, city council, and city leaders. As I sat and listened, I began to understand what my job was as a budget advocate. My goal was to become a translator from city government to community members. To translate, the, the, sorry, translate for the average stakeholder to understand the budget and the city government. My point of view of the budget is what the language, my point of view of the budget is that the language is a language that needs to be translated so that everyone can understand it. When most people can understand the budget, we can have more community participation. Does back, what does back to basics actually mean? What is transparency and what is metrics based? It all depends on who is speaking and who your audience is. My main goal as a budget advocate was safety, policing and economic development. I am amazed at the budget because policing receives 17% of the budget and economic development receives 0.22% of our budget. I believe that there's a cause and effect to everything that happens in our city. And I believe that we have to place our budget and our priorities on the cause and less on the effect. I know that um, I represent South Los Angeles and I feel that there's a difference in all of our cities. Every city has its difference. Every city has what it believes is important to its part of the city of Los Angeles. I do believe that we can bring those differences together and have conversations based on what we feel is important and help other people to understand what we feel is important. And I do believe that our crime rate is down and that is so awesome for Los Angeles, and I do believe that our budget reflects that, but I also feel that policing is a Los Angeles city issue, but our prison system is not. And I do believe that we need to incorporate those two to show that our crime rate is down, but our policing system, our, our jails are filled 300% of its capacity. So I do feel that we need to understand all parts of our city and bring those things together to affect our stakeholders. So like I mentioned, the budget for me is more of a translation. It's more of helping all community members understand what is said in the city. What is a pension? What is a revenue? What are those things? And we can translate those things for our community members to understand. Then we can have more participation in our budget and more participation in our city. As a budget advocate, I know that it is a lot of work, as they've mentioned, but it's not difficult work. It's fun work, and you don't realize how much you're doing. 
you run around a lot, you meet with city officials, you meet with department heads. Um, I was able to meet with the city attorney of Los Angeles, the assistant chief of police, and different people like Jan Perry also with economic development. I was able to bring my perspective from South Los Angeles and bring that perspective to the budget advocates as well as the city leaders. And that was very effective and I feel that we can be an effective team to tackle our budget, to help our mayor, to help our city, and to help our community stakeholders. So with that, I just wanted to present my idea of the budget and the budget advocate process. Thank you. Hello everyone again, uh, my name's Ed Novi, and I'm from the Solon Tahunga Neighborhood Council. Thank you so much, Danelle. You, you have to realize when you're hearing Danielle and myself, uh, if Jack Humphrey Bill were gonna be here, he would also talk. We're trying to let you know our experiences through neighborhood, that what we've experienced being a, a, a budget advocate for all of you. I think it's really important for all of you to latch on to an interest that you want to follow, that you want to make a difference in. For instance, Christy Clark here is very much into the entertainment industry. That's a perfect niche for her to follow. Other people here want to follow how the police interact with our communities. Other people want to look at infrastructure. Mine was pension reform, and that's kind of what I've been following for the last couple of years. It's one of the more snooze parts of the, the budget. And when I first started talking about pension reform, I had brought out this little piece of paper. I had, yeah, I know, it's pretty small. You can't really see it. So I actually had all the budget reps a couple years ago hold it up. And I now realize that we need a bigger elephant to talk about pension reform. And so I want to introduce everybody. First, I want to ask, can everybody see the elephant in the room? Okay, right? So I want you to realize, we, we've even nicknamed him Stompy, who is uh, Dumbo's older brother. And this is the, the pension liability elephant. Keep in mind that the pension system alone takes about a billion dollars a year out of the city budget. That's a huge number. We're talking 22% of the city budget goes to Stompy. And what Stompy is doing, I don't know how many of you can see on the bottom, Stompy is impacting our infrastructure, our parks, street services, police, fire, economic development. Every dollar that's going into the pension system is a dollar that's not going into city services. Now, I want to make sure I make this point very clear that the, all of the possible solutions to the pension liability issue, they're already out there. There's lots of other cities who've already done the groundbreaking work. However, the city of LA, as great as you've heard this morning we are, we're the only big city that has not had a pension reform commission to really look at every possible idea to move forward because Stompy, it, it's not going away over the next couple years. And in fact, you just heard from Mr. Zantana that if we have a recession or if the courts don't uh, rule in the city's behavior, Stompy's gonna get bigger. I don't wanna bring in an eight by eight banner next year because people still don't understand that we're not talking <laughs> about doing something about Stompy. It, Stompy really, it, you can tell my passion. I love Stompy and we, we, we we really have to look at somehow remediating this problem. And I think all of you, when you go upstairs and you start thinking, discussing what kinds of issues are important to you, you'll find your own stompy. You'll be able to latch onto an issue and you'll be able to move forward and benefit the, your fellow city uh, stakeholders. So that's part of the big thing about uh, going upstairs and getting engaged. We have a great team working with Rick Cole and with Miguel Santana and the mayor. It's gonna be a fantastic budget year. The next speaker was gonna be Jack Humphreyville and I'm just gonna do a quick little plug and I'm gonna move along here. 
Jack Humphreyville, his passion was living within your means. He pushed it, he pushed it, he pushed it. Now the mayor has actually adopted it as one of his 10 points to put the city back on a sustainable approach. Sustainability is where we need to be, whether it's through pension reform, and keep in mind, pension reform doesn't mean we're antagonistic with uh, the city unions. It means that as neighborhood council representatives, we want a seat at the table during these discussions. We belong as part of that picture. I think that's going to be it for me now. Uh, uh, this is this is my last uh, budget uh, advocate event, so I've been uh, I've really enjoyed the process over the last couple years. I'm so happy to see so many other new faces being involved, which is very cool. Uh, Jack thanks you from his uh, beachside place in Georgia, I think, right now. Um, and I'm going to turn this over to uh, Joanne, who will give our closing remarks. Thank you so much. Good morning, I'm Joanne Yovanek Garb, West Hills Neighborhood Council, but also co-chair of the Budget Advocates for this past year. Uh, by now you've learned a little bit about the budget process for our wonderful city. The budget process is very involved and complicated. It starts in July and August, with each department setting their needs and goals, and ends in May or June with the adoption of a budget for the new fiscal year by the City Council. We've learned much from Mayor Garcetti, Mr. Santana, Mr. Galprin, and Mr. Krikorian, and Rick Cole. Um, budget advocates and budget reps are all about empowerment. We, the Neighborhood Council, we have Empower Yourself, Empower Your Community, Empower LA. It is our trademark, empowerment. Um, when I, just a little uh, story. Um, my daughter and son-in-law were buying a new car uh, just uh, uh, three weeks ago. And they were going out to Simi Valley and Thousand Oaks to dealerships there. And I said, why are you not going to a dealership here in LA? She said, well, it doesn't make a difference. A car's a car. I said, no. When you buy in the city of LA, you are supporting the city of, of LA. We are not getting, we are not getting the business tax. Yes, we're getting our percent of the sales tax, but we're not getting the business tax and we're not getting the benefit of the salaries that are paid to these people that are supporting the city of Los Angeles. So we need to become more by LA. That, I think that should be our trademark. BLA by LA. Um, when we, we are going to be breaking into our respective district groups and discussing the needs of our individual neighborhoods. We will be electing three budget advocates from each district. Anyone wishing to become a budget advocate, please consider carefully the time requirement. This is an assignment that is going to require at least two monthly meetings, time for meetings with individual city departments, city department heads to determine their needs and goals, meeting with officials to help develop a budget survey, write our findings in the white paper, organize and attend regional budget day in the spring, and concluding with the organization in attendance at our next budget day in June. We're going to read adjourn to the 10th floor to our respective districts. Note that each room will have two districts with two separate elections. Please be respectful of each budget rep and or stakeholders' comments and questions. Newly elected budget advocates will then convene to elect officers and begin the, the planning process. Thank you. <laughs>